Jesus loved me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones for him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. <clears throat> yes, Jesus loves me. All right, welcome back to the Kino Corner. I know that I said uh, about a month ago I was taking a two-month-long break, but this is a bit of an impromptu video because M. Fleming came to stay with me for a couple days because he's off chasing tornadoes. That is right. I am in town as part of a larger filming trip for a video I have planned about tornadoes, codename Tornado Town. Yeah. So uh, before uh, Emp came here, we were discussing like what movies that we wanted to watch, and uh, you had wanted to watch like a tornado themed movie, and I think I suggested Gummo because I had just watched that for the first time, maybe about a month ago, a month or so ago, and I really liked it. And you know, it's all like framed around this tornado in Ohio. So uh, the first night you had me watch this Team Fortress Two SFM called. Emesis Blue. That's correct. And I had to balance it out with uh, some art house Kareen Kino. That's right. You know, yeah. you can't go, you can't go to the Kino Corners place of residence, the Kino Palace, without getting served up some delicious Kino content. I brought my pick, Emesis Blue, just because I'm a big TF2 fan, and I wanted to see Kino Corners' opinion if that was the real deal. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. Really? Yeah, I thought it was pretty good. It was a lot better than I thought it would be. Um, I didn't really know what I was expecting, but I told you that I had a couple gripes with it. We'll get to Gummo in a second. I had a couple gripes with it. Uh, for one, it had the whole villain throw thing where it's like the, the villain gets a hold of the character <laughs> yeah. and he could kill him so easily and he just throws him. And I was like, oh, I just hate that trope so much because I'm thinking like, if you're the villain and you have the guy that's like your nemesis there and you have him there and you can kill him, why don't you just do it? It's like, okay. It's, it's the heavy. He's a little slow. Yeah. <laughs> and the other problem I had with it is that they, they will light up their cigarettes take one puff and then throw it on the ground and stamp it out and i'm like man that's that, a waste that did happen six or seven times <laughs> yeah, in the movie. A lot. but you know it it stands on its own it's a great <laughs> leap forward in source filmmaker animations i've been watching these things all the way back when people still use gmod in the days of kitty 0706 and and they've finally come to a point where where it is like actually worthy of being recognized as a cinematic achievement it, I mean, I, you know, a lot of work went into it, and it was way better produced than I thought it would be. But anyways, on to Gummo. So uh, Gummo is uh, Harmony Kareen's, I think, first movie or one of his first movies. Uh, it came out in the mid-'90s. And I remember the first time that I watched it, I was actually kind of blown away by the credits. Um, it has a music supervisor, Randall Poster, who's a bit of a legend when it comes to being a music supervisor. He's a, a music supervisor to a lot of Wes Anderson's movies. And it was edited by uh, Christopher Tellefson, who famously edited for Whit Stillman. He edited Metropolitan and uh, quite a few movies that I really love. And, um, of course, the movie stars uh, one of my favorite actresses, especially from that era, uh, Chloe, Se uh, Chloe Sevigny, um, or Sevigny, uh, uh, who famously was in The Brown Bunny. She was also in uh, Kids and The Last Days of Disco. Uh, really great actress. Um and, you know, she was like the, I guess, the it girl or the indie it girl at that time. And to me, uh, you know, so the first thing that really struck me with Gummo was just how for this movie, he was able to get so many creative and super talented people together for this very strange film. Oh, and Linda Mans, Linda Mans, who was in Days of Heaven. Uh, it's and I was blown away that he was able to get this like group of people together for this movie, which is kind of a uh experiments with the form of cinema uh, i kind of liken it to almost feeling like dada cinema and that he is going against a lot of conventions and uh, i think that harmony kareen at one point said that what he wants to make is basically cinematic nonsense but even with that in mind uh, there's much more of a through line through Gummo, and even though a lot of it might feel nonsensical or feel like it's not connected there is this kind of 
feeling and tone and atmosphere that right. connects everything. I, I did not consider it nonsensical at all. Yeah. I, I found it very sensible, very coherent, very poignant with, with what it was trying to achieve. So um, I'm coming into this with the sort of tornado perspective. Yeah, t- tell I, us like, about the tornado that it's basically framed so around. So I've, I've always been interested in severe weather, extreme weather effects. Since I was a kid, I minored in meteorology in college. And so this town, uh, which I, I, I thought I asked you going in and you seemed to say it was a fictional town, but I remember they name dropped the town in the film. It's a town called Zinnia, Ohio. And they got hit notoriously in 1974 by one of the most destructive tornadoes in history. Um, and, and while the tornado specifically does not really get featured or discussed hardly any, it's more of a framing device for what the um, present day decay of the town is. It, it, it really sets the stage for this town, this like Rust Belt area town that is having contracting population. And all these people in the town are basically just aimless, directionless, and they have to kind of now exist in this wasteland where it was conceivably this once thriving, vibrant town. But ever since the tornado destroyed most of it, um, a lot of the people just never came back. And, and there's still long lasting damage, extreme yeah. and psychological damage. Yes. Um, and that's not and that's also just like the Rust Belt in general, because after uh, industry moved out, like. Rust Belt in the 80s became, you know, almost like post-apocalyptic. And, you know, and this is like a more extreme version of that because of the tornado. So um, there's a couple different storylines, a couple different through lines through this. And uh, with each of the storylines, there's this uh, kind of omnipresent sense of of death and of uh, grief. Um, so the two main boys that are going around killing cats, uh, the, the younger boy... Uh, his father died conceivably in this tornado and the older boy his his mother died do you still miss her yeah there's not a day it goes by that i don't miss her and then with the bunny uh he is as far as we know um he's an orphan uh, i think that the bunny character as well is kind of like our spiritual guide like he feels like more of a surreal he, character he, he's nonverbal. Yeah, he does not speak through the whole film. And the impression I got out of the boy and the rabbit ears is that he he is sort of a product, almost like a specter or phantom created Mm -hmm. out of this town where there's so much um, such a backdrop of tragedy. And in the present day in the film, there's just like so much heartache and they're living in a brutal situation but everyone has seemingly become inundated to it where it's it's just become normal life where it's supposed to present this extremely evocative like disgusting like disgust Mm -hmm. is a very heavily focused on theme in the film or the tone rather and um we are so we as the regular observers in like non-contracting non-tornado destroyed towns we look into it and you're supposed to be left with the impression of like, how can these people live like this? It, it, it's one matter of framing the town as just this disgusting place, but it becomes disturbing when you realize that the people in this town, that's just how they live. And this is normality for them when yeah. impartial observers would consider it just like an awful, awful circumstance. Yeah. And Kareem does a really great job of just like having the characters play everything super straight and making it seem like there's really nothing, nothing off with, with anything that they do. Like it's totally normal for the two boys to go out and, and kill cats, sell it to the guy that owns the shop and then use the money to, uh, to buy glue to huff and then to use the rest of the money to maybe get uh, milkshakes and to, uh, and to have sex with some I'm guy's s- retarded daughter that he y- pimps out. Yeah, or or sister. I'm I'm not quite sure. It might be his sister. It might be his daughter. I mean, either way, it's it's, it's really disgusting. It's, every every yeah. single <laughs> every single thing in the film is designed to make you feel uncomfortable and to make your skin crawl. And it was engaging. I'm gonna go fuck her now. Well, you want to fuck her? Yeah. Well, you gonna fuck her too? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was engaging because of that. I'm not exactly like a huge like torture per torture porn uh like weird uncomfortable situation but the way they f- the way they set up a lot of the scenes in the movie like it is dirty 
Yeah. It, it, it looks... C- get it, down to the production design, too, because, like, almost all the houses look like hoarder houses. Right. You know, it's like there's all sorts of crap just, like, uh, stacked up. I mean, when he goes into the basement, there's, like, a uh, disused toilet in the basement with all these magazines and all these, like, Barbie dolls and stuff. And, um, and, and talking about Dirty, I think the most famous scene in the movie, which uh, uh, is a scene that just stands out to me as being, like... I love the scene so much is when he's eating spaghetti in the bathtub right and the bathtub water looks it's just brown it's just it's it's obviously contaminated with something yeah. it is like not safe for yeah. human habitation and he's like putting his his head underwater he has the piece of bacon strapped yeah, to he, the wall he's like swishing the water in and out of his mouth yeah it's a completely unsanitary <laughs> the gross the grossest thing was when he drops the crunch bar into the water and then takes it out and eats it yeah, and then Linda Manns is uh, is uh, washing his hair, and then she's just like trying to get rid of the shampoo, and it looks like some of that shampoo just falls in his spaghetti, and he continues eating. Yeah, so she's just this obsessive, compulsive woman who clearly has like a lot of mental problems, but is is like trying to just barely piece the life together. But but clearly with it, it was a great performance. It was probably like my most favorite performance of the film. Um, She's clearly like got a screw loose. Yeah. Obviously, probably, probably the trauma she it, it, it she brings up a lot the her husband who died conceivably in the tornado, and um, it, it's caused her to like spiral into a deteriorated mental state. But her charisma acts like she's almost trying to pass as normal, while the the setting and the scene and you realize the space she has created is indicative of someone who's very mentally unwell. Hey, you son of a bitch, if you don't smile, I'm going to kill you, okay? I've killed before, and I will kill again. Yeah, and I think that that's really what Gummo does is because Gummo, more than anything, is like a portrait of this town. Like, we have these these three different storylines. The other storyline we didn't uh, we haven't gotten to yet is the storyline with uh, Chloe Sevigny and her sisters and how their cat gets loose. Of course, that coincides with the, the two boys who are uh, out killing cats. And... Uh, what what Gummo really does is it uses the setting and it uses the production design and set design to uh, express like this um, the inner nature of the characters. Um, so like you know seeing all of, like the hoarding inside the houses that you, you can almost like I mean it, of course like you were saying like this is the movie of Imagine the Smell. Yes, but <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> You know, you could also see it as, like, all the sort of baggage that they haven't, like, gotten through yet. Because, like, these these unclean interiors is is, is indicative of a sort of heavy set it was, trauma-laden life. It was very, like, what sold it for me, it, it just felt very real and gritty. Um, I, I've lived in rural places. I've been through a bunch of rural, low-income places. And you see a bunch of places where there's a bunch yeah. of trash and industrial waste and nothing is orderly i I, th- I think there's a lot of movies that fixate on the poor but it, it's produced by people who've like either never been around it or have only like seen it from secondhand sources and have not actually been immersed in those environments and this movie this movie really hit it for me like th- like i've been yeah in places like the the town of Xenia as it's portrayed in the film. Yeah, and well, they sh- so they shot the movie mostly in Nashville, but the movie also incorporates like documentary style footage and like home videos that adds to this like realness factor. Um, right. So and it's, it, it's very yeah. well integrated. It's almost like the direction of, of the actors. They, I, I assume they were probably made to watch some of the home videos and they were maybe taken to the location to sort of get a sense of um, how a lot of these people kind of act day to day how they just deal with living in what is essentially just a wasteland just an abandoned place that american institutions have failed yeah yeah and uh you know you have like these these stories that uh sometimes it's like you have uh what feels kind of like poems over it uh, or just regular people talking like talking about black people and their ideas of them or the girl talking about her dad molested her um, and, and some of them are a little bit uh, funnier. Like there's the one albino 
woman who's doing a whole thing about uh, what she's looking for in a man, and she's like doing this dance like this. And yeah, so to, I, that, to one, me, that, that one was a real person, right? I assume. I not assu- an actor. I assume so. I don't know. Um, I'll put tech. I'll look into that. I'll put text on the screen uh, if it was a real person or not. But to me, that's that little segment kind of felt almost proto Million Dollar Extreme. Like it feels like something yeah. that could have been in World Peace. I like men that are very sensitive. That will sit down and watch a good movie with me. When I watched it, I was kind of actually blown away that Charles Carroll hadn't hadn't seen Gummo, because um, I thought that I was like for sure this would be like a big influence on them. Right. Yeah. Um, I like I liked how the movie the characters are all odd. Of course, but th- this is this is certainly something you see in rural areas, especially where there's places of just perpetual cycles of broken families, unemployment, lawlessness. You end up with people who they're not quite socialized correctly, and I I, I think it's some movies. I don't like how they portray like rural areas. I, it comes off as condescending, but but this movie, the tone was definitely a lot more neutral like it was a matter of fact like this is yeah. how the people are they weren't really caricature straw man people they, they felt real they felt believable the eccentricities were in a way where it felt like you wouldn't be able to make it up you you had to have encountered certain people like this before before you could put it in the script i also want to point out that like uh by by modern standards you might uh you might consider this movie woke in a certain way because uh because of all like the representation that it has but it unlike like disney movies it integrates it like very well into the story like there's a talk about how one of the main characters uh brothers moved to a city and became transgender there's the the gay kid who dresses up like as uh dresses up as a woman cross dresser in photos there's the kid who gets diagnosed with add ADD. and goes on ritalin take ritalin this kind of prescription drug it's not like a drug that fucks you up if anything makes you normal there's the um the deaf couple that are having a fight in the bowling alley and there's the black small person it, it still feels contemporary although yeah. now they'd probably be everyone would be obese and they'd be on fentanyl yeah and instead of cats they'd be hunting pit bulls but <laughs> yeah. largely but like but like how kareen integrated it it wasn't like it wasn't like bringing these to the forefront to be like oh this is like a big deal or something like that it was like as i said it it maintained that neutral neutral tone throughout it so it felt all very natural to the setting and you know but who knows maybe like one of these youtubers will will watch and be like has kareen gone woke (laughs) (laughs) even though it was almost 30 years ago now (laughs) yeah yeah, it, it definitely still has a contemporary tone to it i mean we we still see neglected parts of america yeah just fall apart government and institutions taxpayer institutions they've completely failed to build a good society and actually improve the quality of life and that's a lot of places in america sadly like flint michigan and, and east palestine it, it hasn't really gotten better since yeah. the 90s yeah i mean technology's gotten better but quality of life um you know i'm not quite sure about quality of life i think i've i've read some reports that quality of life is actually on a uh, downward spiral. Yes, <laughs> I've definitely been feeling Gummo. <laughs> Gummo is a downward spiral movie. It's uh, I w- it, it plays yeah. into my disillusionment, and I know it's a movie, is like not real, but like it, the the reason it works is because it reflects a reality of these rural, low income places where, and I, I think it's to the film's strength. Yeah, I think it's to the film's strength that it came out right before. The internet was common because it really solidifies just the emptiness mm-hmm. and boredom that these people experience yeah. where they have to fill it with just these really extreme vices or, or, or just completely uncomfortable yeah. situations that as a neutral observer, you're, you're, you're just wondering the steps required to even cause it to happen this way. And before uh, there's workers in the office, so if you hear background noise, that's just the workers i hope that that's not uh such a big deal but um but yeah no so i want to talk about a couple scenes because i only have you here for a few more minutes um i want to talk about a couple scenes i want to talk about the uh the arm wrestling scene uh so there's the scene where the boy and his dad are with all these other guys in town and they have this arm wrestling uh thing and then when the really big guy loses to the uh to the small guy uh, he just like destroys the table 
And then it's this like bizarre surreal scene where right after that, a guy is wrestling a chair. Right. And, and you know, that's like, uh, yeah, it, it sounds absurd. Yeah. It, this is like one of those things where it's like, you couldn't write it from like your imagination. Like you, you almost have to have probably seen people like this or seen a scenario where this happened. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a scene that kind of incorporates fiction into reality with the bunny he walks into this like uh, junkyard and there are these two boys dressed as cowboys and and it's like uh, Lord of the Flies in a sense um, because you get a sense that I mean maybe these boys have parents maybe they don't uh, but they're taken out of whatever context of any kind of familial household that they have and they have like uh, cap guns and they shoot him and the and the bunny pretends to, to die and lay on the ground but they proceed to then like abuse the kid and right, shout yeah. all sorts of like mean things and go through his pockets and he just kind of lets it happen and it's like and it t- to me it feels like like he's playing into it like this is fantasy but it almost feels like a like some sort of humiliation they, they are really like inflicting some yeah. kind of like negative emotions on this kid this shitty ass rabbit stinks i know he smells like pussy and um, yeah, I find it interesting that th- there's really very few old people in the movie. It is a film about the effects of just this degenerating society on youth, and yeah. and that's important as as a means of demonstrating that this is cyclical. It is perpetual. These people will grow up to be just as messed up as their parents. The only way out is to just get money and escape, or else you will just wind up twenty years in the future in the different role with like some other weird yeah. kids that are also being corrupted by yeah, the and situation. We, and we see that especially with the the one of the two main boys, um, with one of the two the older of the the cat killers, where he has these really kind of disturbing home videos of himself, uh, which are evocative of um should I don't know if YouTube will let me say it. But a cer- cer- a this, certain incident in nineteen ninety nine in yeah. Colorado. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that was that was extra disturbing, and they, they, the filmmakers hadn't even obviously yeah. planned for that to happen. But that, in in retrospect, that adds an additional disturbing layer to the yeah. movie. And so, like this is this yeah. is the type of community that would cause would foster this. whatever the, yeah. this specific event to occur. Yeah, and so um, you know, in the in the film, he says like, "Tomorrow I'm going to a mental asylum." Uh, Because obviously he's mentally unwell and we really kind of get that feeling over the course of the movie. But I think where it really comes to a head is uh, so there's this kid who's uh, who's this gay kid who um, is uh, also killing cats at night. He's putting poison around. He's the rival cat killer. He's he's the rival cat killer. The main characters. So the so the two cat killers, they, they put on these like fairly disturbing looking like old lady um, masks and they go into his house with BB guns and uh, it looked like a golf clubs and they go there uh, but he's not there and it seemed like they were there to like beat him up to just sort of do some kind of mafia style like stop stop uh, you know like you're on our turf and uh, they go through and it was pretty funny uh, the little kid is going through all of his uh, his porn magazines and it's like and then he gets to the bottom and he's like he's got a gay one <laughs> yeah and they, they find pictures of him Cross-dress. One of the original femboy portrayals in yeah, cinema, exactly. probably. It, 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 hey, if he was if he was around in 2023, he'd be making a lot of money online. Oh yeah, he'd be making six figures a month on OnlyFans. <laughs> the um, but then the really disturbing part of that, uh, like that scene does start off like kind of funny, like kind of dark, but also kind of funny. It gets really disturbing because he has his 90 or 91 year old grandmother who's essentially comatose, catatonic. On, yeah, catatonic. Just, un, just unable, nonverbal, unable yeah. to even like, communicate. So she's just like lying on this bed, and they say that she smells really bad, and she's just hooked up to these machines, and they try waking her up, and so the the older boy is like, uh, um, you know, patting her hair, and then he's like, shoot her in the foot, and to see if that wakes her up. So the younger kid shoots her with the bb gun in the foot and it does nothing and because of that the older kid goes and just like turns off her life support and And he basically just puts her out of her misery yeah and he's like is she dead and he's like well she's dead now and then i think he says she's always been dead she's been gone a long time 
which is a very like strange line like she's always been dead it's an ethical dilemma that we're dealing with today in contemporary society but you know but the thing is is like that line of she's always been dead it's like in a sense they also i think they also feel like they're in the state of purgatory yeah uh, the the woman is very much an allegory for the town like you could argue the the town as they knew it died when it got destroyed by the tornado but they're still there they're just still stuck there in this perpetual state and even though the grandmother woman can finally pass on and be put out of her misery. They're just stuck there in the yeah. situation indefinitely. So that's, yeah. it's like a tragic but very memorable scene and very like very strong metaphor for what the film is trying to represent. Yeah, and the other metaphor throughout this film that's like played on in the background is that uh, black cat, who, Chloe Sevigny's black cat, who they think is pregnant at first, and so it's like there's this uh, there's this maybe hope of of life but spoiler alert at the end it gets killed and we see the the two main guys yeah, the, the the two the two plots finally uh intersect intersect at the end with and, them just like the very filling just, the cat with bb's very sad but um ultimately yeah. poignant actually scene. all three all three uh because the because oh, it's yeah. the bunny that actually finds the cat and it's after he is like kissing chloe Stephanie and her sister um and this very kind of strange surreal scene which has me kind of thinking that maybe he's not even like a real person but some sort of spirit um and uh and i also want to because we only have like i think two minutes left so i also want to get to another like very uh a, a side story that that plays into this kind of theme of of death and decay uh especially of like of the youth and at the very beginning uh one of the main boys is making out with uh, his girlfriend in this like junk car and there's like a trash fire literally literally right yeah. in front of them and he says you have a lump in your titty then later on in the film she's at the hospital and they have to do a mastectomy on her and she goes on about how basically her life is over because boys will no longer look at her this idea of like this budding youth that it, it's is, just completely yeah. exterminated yeah it's just like you you have to live the rest of your life now is just like a wandering spirit almost yeah. where the, your your personhood is being eroded away from you from this toxic environment yeah and and basically all the characters in here are these like wandering aimless spirits that are like stuck in this this kind of purgatory uh that and it just gives a sense that like the tornado it might not have killed every it might not have killed everyone but it basically did kill everyone like that it was a spiritual death that came with the physical death uh in that town right yeah so i guess final thoughts on the movie here i really enjoyed it i i thought it's probably one of the best films i've ever seen in terms of being constantly engaging all the way through and also managing to be coherent and present strong tonal messages without having a conventional structured plot. Yeah, I, I call it impressionist. I guess to use a painting term, where it it creates these tones. And while the the plot itself is is not very explicitly told, you certainly it's certainly successful mm-hmm. at delivering what exactly it wants to convey to the audience. Yeah, and it's also like. Uh, it's it's a movie that really gets under your skin in terms of its griminess, in terms of some of its imagery and the kind of darkness of it, but it maintains a levity with actually quite a bit of humor. And the characters, you know, you end up like, e- even if the characters are messed up, you end up really liking them. Uh, there's a lot of humanity to, to everybody. I mean, just, just thinking about how, like, with he's able to turn that, like, the brother or the dad prostituting his uh, daughter or or sister um, into something that feels more human when the younger kid goes in and he just sits with her and he's like in love with her and and it's this weird and it's a, and it's a disturbing set it's a disturbing sequence but yeah. it's like they find that humanity it, even it, within it's it. like each scene has so much darkness within it but th- there is always like a small like a glimmer of light yeah. in these people where they, they haven't been completely, it's not entirely nihilistic. They haven't been completely like ruined as individuals. Yeah. There, there's like they're the more like in a limbo state. There's the potential for them to have redemption, but, but they're just inundated in just this complete storm uh, of just like foul, yeah. foul territory in their environment. 
So my final thoughts are from here on out, I am taping bacon to the wall of my bathtub and I will forever only eat spaghetti when I'm in the bath. Spaghetti. So, uh, M. Plumman, thanks for joining me here, and uh, this video should be up pretty soon. And um, after this, we're going to record a follow-up video to be put on my second channel, Downward Diary, where we are talking about the Mario the movie. Mario movie. And before I forget, um, so before I forget, I just want to say you see that we're in uh, my new Fudo offices where I work. We are currently looking for uh, projects. Uh, so if you have a project that you want to get funded, just email us at grantapps at fudo.org. I will have that email in the description below. Thank you everyone for watching and uh, I'll see you all in the next video. Yeah, hope you like Gummo if you end up watching it. <laughs>